Good morning, welcome, and thank you for joining us for Medical Alley Association's Bringing the Future Forward series. Today's topic is establishing trust and advancing health equity initiatives through community and Medical Alley. My name is Alexis Kohansky, and I am the Director of Member Engagement with Medical Alley Association. I am thrilled to have the opportunity to lead a discussion on this critically important topic, and we have quite the agenda. We will begin with a fireside chat discussion with 3M's healthcare group president, Mojde Poole, and then transition into a panel discussion with leaders throughout the Medical Alley community on what it takes to identify, develop, and establish the most effective community partnerships to advance health equity. Led by no other than Medical Alley's VP of Intelligence, Frank Jess Kelke. But before we get started, I wanna take a few moments to acknowledge and thank our event sponsors, Diversified Plastics and a couple of gurus. Without their support, events like this would not be possible. So as I said, before we get started, I'd like to turn it over to Kevin from Diversified Plastics to offer a few words. Well, good morning, Alexis, and thank you and welcome everybody. And just uh, uh, a little bit about Diversified Plastics, we're a strong supporter of Medical Alley. And specifically, we're a sponsor of a new initiative the, of the association kicked off earlier this year, Medical Alley Starts. And that fits very well into our community orientation. Uh, Diversified Plastics is a ESOP, a 100% uh, comp employee-owned company. And our focus, uh, high focus towards med device, med tech. And we can support that with our legacy injection molding technology. But specifically for the STARTS program, we utilize our digital manufacturing technology under our acceleration station banner with the tagline fastest uh, path to market. And it's specifically appropriate for the early stage emerging med device company who really needs to uh, work through uh, a lot of early stage uh, product configurations. And what we're excited because we just recently announced a grant program in association with Medical Alley, which we will provide uh, engineering, consulting, and actually production services for qualified uh, early stage med device companies in Minnesota. And I encourage people either on the webinar or if you know people more in the med device med tech segment, to uh, look at our website, diversifiedplastics.com, or the Medical Alley site, and you'll find information on that grant program. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I would like to next turn it over to Keith from A Couple of Gurus. I am the chief guru of A Couple of Gurus. Uh, <clears throat> proud to support the community here at Medical Alley. Um, we've been working with um, regulated manufacturing uh, for the past uh, two decades, and uh, we provide managed security and managed services uh, to those uh, industries, um, and which, as you can tell these days, makes life very uh, interesting and fun with everything that's going on uh, uh, with uh, uh, cyber attacks and whatnot, and always having to stay ahead of the game, but um, uh, makes life interesting, uh, kind of uh, the challenges, same as the challenges found in, in healthcare. Uh, and uh, my uh, my one pondering question for uh, that probably will not get answered is how do we cure seasonal allergies? Thank you. <laughs> Always good to get a good laugh out. Thank you both for um, once again your sponsorship and your support of Medical Alley Association. Thank you. So we're going to kick off this uh, fireside chat. Um, as I shared at the beginning, I am so thrilled to have Mojde here with us today. Um, Mojde is the group president of 3M's healthcare business, which encompasses biopharmaceuticals, medical device, food safety, medical solutions, oral care, health information systems. And she leads a global team of more than 13,000 employees spanning five decision, divisions, which total 7 billion in global annual sales. And I have to add this part. In 2020, she was identified as modern healthcare's 100 most influential people in healthcare. And just this year, she was listed as one of the top 25 women leaders in medical device. Mojde, welcome. 
Thank you so much, uh, Alexis. It's really, really a pleasure to be here. And I look forward to spending the next half an hour to talk a little bit about 3M and obviously 3M Healthcare and the passion that we have for improving every life and also to advance health equity. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. We are so grateful to have you. So let's kick off you know, this event with a discussion about 3M. We all know about 3M from posted notes and some of the consumer products, but 3M is so, so much more than that, especially the healthcare business. So can you tell our audience more about it? Yeah, so um, for those of you who are not familiar with 3M, we are a, about a $32 billion um, diverse global organization. And as you said, you're mostly familiar with some of our key brands, but uh, we have actually four different business groups. Um, my business group, healthcare being one of them, but the other business groups are safety and industrial, transportation and electronics, and consumer uh, business group. And as you can imagine, uh, we serve many different customers, many, many different markets, and we also um, operate with very different business and go-to-market models. And the vastness of our technology and products are so much that we always have this saying within 3M that you're never more than 10 feet away from a, a 3M technology. And that goes with even the handheld device that you carry with you every day. So that's a little bit about the broader 3M. Uh, when it comes to healthcare business group, we have a very strong global healthcare business. And I'd like to make a correction, Alex. Last year, uh, the revenues that we had was about $8 billion in healthcare. And uh, the folks on this uh, webinar may be familiar with some of our uh, bigger brands in healthcare, like uh, Littman stethoscopes or Tegaderm dressings, but we're obviously a lot more than that, as you mentioned. And you uh, laid out the divisions that we have. I just want to go a click in to talk about some of the technologies that we bring and solutions that we bring to the market. Uh, medical solutions division is our largest business, and we serve um, uh, markets in wound care as well as, um, you know, the infection prevention solutions that are used, as well as the uh, vascular access um, products and solutions that we bring to the market. Then we have a health information systems and uh, division, which their technology and methodologies are really used by healthcare providers in order to be able to um, increase and improve efficiencies and productivity in their healthcare systems, as well as identify and remove waste and, and costs from their systems. We also have an oral care business which serves both dental and orthodontic uh, markets. And the separation and purification business is the business that really serves the biopharma industry. We provide filtration and separation uh, technologies for um, that are used for development as well as manufacturing of uh, vaccine, therapeutics, and also we have membrane technologies that go into very much of a, a critical medical devices that are used on the sickest patients like blood oxygenation devices. And a business that we have, which is the smallest one, but it's the near and dear, nearest and dearest probably to my heart, is uh, where I had my first general management role is food safety business. It's a small business, but a mighty one. And we basically serve the food and uh, beverage manufacturers. They test, use their pro our products to test their, their uh, food and beverages for safety and quality before they put them on the shelf. So uh, quite a diverse, uh, diverse portfolio of products we have. Definitely diverse um, and, and just impeccable and the role that 3M Healthcare continues to play in innovation. In the intro, I highlighted you guide a global team of more than 13,000 employees. And one thing that stands out about your leadership is your story. I would love for you to tell our audience more about your journey to serving as the group president of 3M's healthcare business. Where did you start and what are some of your experiences in between? Yeah, um, thanks for asking that question. I always like to talk about it. So purpose has been a key element um, that has played a role in my life and career and continues to do so. I am a firm believer that as long as you're passionate about it, you believe in it, you excel in it. And what I have found that the, is that the purpose has really led to commitment, uh, determination, and in challenging times like we have all had over the last uh, year and a half, two years, uh, it leads to resilience. So 
Um, that's why I think it's uh, it's been integral to where where I am. And for me, it kind of started back when I was in middle school. Um, back then, I knew that I wanted to be an engineer. So I came to the U.S. back in '84. I wanted to study mechanical engineering, so I got my bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering. And then later on, I followed that with an MBA to kind of broaden um, my opportunities in terms of future career moves. And I have been fortunate over the last 30 years that I have worked uh, with many great companies, many great global companies, and I've held very broad set of experiences Uh, all the way starting from an engineer in General Electric to then moving on to be a marketing executive with Boston Scientific and Medtronic, and then leading to now leading a multi-billion dollar healthcare business for 3M. So I'm fortunate for all the, um, uh, I feel pretty fortunate for having all the experiences I've had. It's been also multifunctional, kind of starting in engineering operations, moving on to the business side and doing international assignments a couple of times, and then uh, obviously general management and business leadership. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. I I must say that, you know, as we were thinking about this event and all the planning that went into it, um, that truly was one of my most favorite parts about having you join us today is is your story, your background, how you got to where you are today. Um, So thank you for sharing. So we're gonna take this opportunity to transition our conversation um, into health equity and health disparities. But I do wanna take a couple of seconds to make a distinction between the two as this topic, you know, sometimes health equity and health disparities is used interchangeably in discussions, but they are two different and distinct terms. So, um, you know, health disparities is a special kind of difference, namely worse health among socially disadvantaged people. Health equity, is the principle underlying a commitment to reduce and ultimately eliminate disparities in health and its determinants, including social determinants. So with all of that said, you know, 3M traditionally in some spaces, they think of it as a manufacturing company. So how, and and tell our audience, how did you all decide to address healthcare disparities um, and tell us some of your thinking behind it? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So obviously with the with COVID back in 2020, we got to experience again firsthand the uh, uh, healthcare disparities that have existed in our society for many, many years. Uh, from early on in, in COVID, during COVID, we started uh, realizing that actually the COVID-related complications and deaths are higher for certain populations like African-Americans, Latinx, as well as the Native Americans. So, and on top of it, when we had the killing of George Floyd happen in our headquarters backyard, it really even further hit home for us. Uh, The fact that we need to to take action. We need to take a lot more uh, bolder actions. And like many other organizations and companies, we did a lot of introspection at that time. We held many listening sessions with our employees, with our employee resource networks, as well as our community partners. And through it, we did a lot of listening to understand. And we talked about uh, and discussed how we could be bolder and making making significant change that will be lasting change. And it was really, at that time, very obvious to us that as a healthcare business, the platform that we we should go after when it comes to social justice is healthcare disparities and and to tackle that through the through, through the lens of social determinants of health. Uh, we're also a global company, so this issue is not just in the US. Uh, this is very much a global issue. Um, developed countries, you know, when you look at Canada, you have the ind- indigenous people uh, factor that you have, and then you look at some uh, emerging economies, for example, Brazil. You have the colorism and racism in India. You have the religion and the caste system. So it's very much prevalent across the globe. And the the fact that it's global and the fact that healthcare disparities are directly linked to social determinants of health are also very much recognized by both national and international organizations like CDC, WHO, uh, United Nations. So when you put all of this together, being a global company, being an industry partner, uh, we, uh, we see no other way but to tackle this, this challenge and issue. 
Absolutely. You know, Mojde, when I heard you just share that perspective, what I heard from you was a lot of underlying passion for this issue. So I'd love to know a little bit more about why you are personally passionate about addressing the issue of, of healthcare disparities. Yes. So um, obviously improving every life is at the core of our mission as a healthcare business. And I'm sure it's the same for many of the people that may be in the audience who are from <clears throat> healthcare provider side or a medical device company or life sciences company. So that's core in, in what, what, everything that we do. And for us to be able to really realize that true mission and passion that we have, which is improving every life, we have to do more. Obviously, what we do in terms of products and services will get us there, but they're going to they're gonna get us there only partly. So we have to do more. And when you look, you, you see that the health outcomes are very much correlated with social determinants of health. And social determinants of health are very much linked to structural and systemic barriers that are in the society for us. And this fact I found, I found a year, year and a half ago, I didn't know this particular fact, but only 20% of health outcomes are actually driven by the care that an individual receives in a healthcare setting. The rest of the 80% really has to do with the socioeconomic as well as environmental factors uh, that, that, an, that an individual uh, is surrounded with every day. And finally, the reason why I'm really excited and passionate about this is that not only is the right thing to do, and not only as an industry partner, we have a we have an obligation and, and responsibility to do something about it. It's also, I'm also finding out it's a huge engagement and um, uh, an inclusion, um, a sense of inclusion for our, for our employees and team members. They are excited about doing their part in advancing health equity. And we believe that we can absolutely do that through the capabilities that we have through the people that we have, and also through the, the products and solutions that we bring to the healthcare market. Definitely. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of passion. We talked about this. We talked about some of the concepts. So in specific, um, as we think about what 3M is doing and how they are approaching this work or how all of you are, can you talk about some of those specific efforts that are ongoing? Yeah, um, Alexa, so 3M has had a rich history of community outreach and um, philanthropic work. We do that through our 3M Gives Foundation, through our employee resource networks, but we have also amplified significantly uh, over the last couple of years our social justice efforts. So I don't know if you know that, but we, we launched our, uh, our commitment of 50 million over the course of the next uh, five years to, to put towards this cause. And as we rolled out our, our, uh, our efforts in this area, we're working around three pillars, which is to achieve equity in, in our workplace, to achieve equity in our processes, and to achieve equity in our community. So when you look at the, uh, the work that we're doing in terms of equity in workplace, it really has to do with a lot of the practices that we have in terms of hiring, developing, and also recruiting um, diverse talent. When you look at uh, equity in our processes, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that we work with more diverse suppliers, partners, vendors. And then when it comes to achieving equity in the uh, communities, we work very closely within each of our business groups in a way um, for them to get engaged with their communities in a way that's authentic to them and the value that they can bring to their, com to their, to their customer base or the particular social platform, social justice platform that they've taken. For example, in the case of our safety and industrial business group, what their platform is, is uh, skilled trades um, upskilling uh, and training. And when you look at the transportation and electronics business group, their platform is about uh, urban mobility and safety. When you look at our consumer business group, their platform is home ownership. And obviously at broader 3M Enterprise, we have always been an advocate of STEM education and we continue to drive that in a big way. We're a science company. We continue to drive those efforts obviously at the broader company. For healthcare, as I mentioned, our platform is um, health equity and access. So that's what we're after. And we work, all of us in 3M, 
very collaboratively with our employee resource networks and community partners to make sure that we, we bring uh, sustainable change in our communities. Thank you, Mojday. With that though, you know, what do you think makes 3M position to tackle this issue of healthcare disparities? Like what, what makes 3M uniquely positioned in this space? Yes, yeah, so um, the the way that we do it, we have a three prong approach. And uh, I have to tell you also in terms of the, the healthcare, I wanna, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna bring it a click down to talk a little bit about healthcare and how in healthcare we're doing that. So taking on the social justice, uh, I'm sorry, the um, healthcare disparities uh, uh, platform that we're after, we wanted to make sure that the role that we're play playing as an industry partner would be a role that is um, making sustainable change, foundational change. We didn't wanna be just funding programs for the sake of funding programs, but we wanted it to be meaningful and bring about sustainable change. Because of that, the way we're approaching it is in a three-prong uh, approach. Number one, we are continuing to amplify the awareness about both healthcare disparities as well as social determinants of health and the linkage between the two. We use many different forums like, a, like this one to both internally and external to 3M to be able to raise the level of knowledge and understanding about these issues at hand. The, the second thing that we're doing is really working and collaborating with community-based organizations as well as um, academic institutions. So what we're finding out is these folks have been at this and they've been doing a lot of work in these areas for a long time. There's a lot to be learned from them. And we're finding that the magic is when we really learn and understand what it is they have done, what it is they want to do, and what are some of the barriers they are they're trying to overcome. That's where the magic happens as to what we can bring into the picture. The other reason why it's really important for us to engage with these audiences, with these stakeholders is that um, they have very much the trust of the marginally um, uh, marginal, uh, you know, uh, uh, parts of the uh, 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 population or the underserved groups of within groups within our population. They have a lot of trust in them, as opposed to maybe the, the kind of trust that they may have from of the healthcare system. And finally, the third way that we're tackling this is through what we bring as, as, a, as 3Mers in terms of our capabilities and products and solutions. Uh, for example, one of the ways that we are engaging with our community partners is through a program called 3M Impact. This program is really a, a volunteer-based program. It's a skill-based program. What we do, we get groups of 3M healthcare employees to be partnering with certain uh, community-based organizations who are already working on healthcare disparities in order to be able to um, make sustainable change in the community. And they're so excited about uh, engaging with the community in this way that we've, we've gotten a huge positive response that we actually are expanding this program to become global as well. I love that. Um, you know, as we talk about establishing and building trust, I think that's one piece that you hit on in building the relationships with the community based organizations. But also sometimes there's this concept that you have to give money, right, and that's going to make some huge change. It really is time, right, and effort. And so that's why when I was doing a little bit of research on 3M impact, and I heard about how 3M employees are leveraging their talents to help make a change on health equity, it was just impeccable. And also, I think the model that potentially other companies and those who are participating and listening today can follow as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that. So, you know, we're talking a little bit about, you know, your leadership in this space. What are some things you have learned? What are some of the experiences that you've taken away since you started this work? Yeah. So first of all, um, this is a big complex issue. And, and as such, um, it's going to require a system-based approach. It's going to require engagement and participation of many different stakeholders and, and solving it in a systemic way. So uh, we are just scratching the surface. So for sure, the, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, the other thing that we're learning is what I talked to you about is 
understanding, getting with the community organizations and, and institutions that have been working on this for a long time and trying to really learn from them and understand what barriers are that need to be lifted. So we have to continue to do more of that. And the other thing that, that, that I think is very important is obviously getting our work done through the community-based organizations and, and the uh, institutions, academic institutions to, to try to get there. And the one other thing we've learned, although this is a tough challenge and requires uh, a lot of effort by many people, we're seeing early success where we put our arms around things and collaborate to, to solve something. And I wanna bring an example for, uh, for, for now. We were working with one of our community partners um, the name of them is uh, Get to Yes Coalition, and they are in dental space. They have been uh, working diligently over the last several years in order to increase the critical dental care access to underserved populations. And uh, they have had uh, slow progress in doing so. So what we did after talking to them and listening to and learning about their experiences, what we did, we connected them with our government affairs professionals who actually helped um, the coalition to put together a very impactful white paper that then was uh, uh, the ask that was made at the Minnesota legislature this past session, and then finally got approved by the Governor Walz. And as a result of it, the Get to US coalition was able to secure about 60 million in funding in state, as well as additional funding from the federal uh, um, governments to be able to actually expand the dental care um, to an additional 15% of Medi Medicaid uh, population. So that's a great example of when we collaborate and when we leverage our skill sets together, we can make progress. I love that. And so for all of our audience out here, you know, some good takeaways from Mojde today. Um, definitely listening to community, understanding some of their challenges, leveraging your talents to eliminate some of the barriers to really impact change. I think that, at least for me, that's what I'm taking away in this discussion, and I think that that is immensely powerful. Um, so, you know, Mojde, what are the next steps for 3M in this area? What is needed in the future? What are you guys up to? Um, you know, how do you continue to move forward in this space? Yes, yeah, so I think it's uh, it's the commitment and and sticking to itness that we have to we have to continue with. Uh, we believe we have a good approach to this. It's an approach that's going to bring um, sustainable change and and foundational change, even if it may be a little bit step at a time and doing it our our way in a little bit step at a time. I think we should do more of it. Uh, we should continue to build awareness. We should continue to collaborate and partner with the community-based organizations and, and institutions, uh, academic institutions. And we have to continue to learn from each other. And it's gonna require many, many stakeholders. It's payers, it's healthcare providers, it's industry, it's the government, it's the community leaders. It's gonna take all of us in order to be able to bring a systemic change about and advance uh, health equity. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm getting sad here because we're almost at time, you know, to have this fireside chat discussion. It's coming to an end, but it's been immensely just helpful to hear your vision and how 3M um, as a whole, but definitely 3M's healthcare business is really approaching this work. Um, as we hope to kind of wrap here, I do want to give you just a couple of more seconds to offer any last thoughts for our audience or things you'd like everyone to take away. Yes, no, thank you very much for everyone uh, for your time and and please uh, continue to to drive this effort, continue to build awareness about it and continue to do to do your part in little ways even it's gonna it's gonna make a big difference. So uh, we look forward to continue to collaborate. Thank you, Moshe. Um, thank you. Oh, yeah, we this was this was great. And I just have to say, you know, Mojde is an impeccable leader. And I had the opportunity to chat with her before this fireside chat discussion. And she is wonderful. And the work she's doing at 3M Healthcare is impeccable. Um, and so I hope that this discussion was as meaningful for all of you listening as it was for me to have this conversation. Um, and so with that, I'd like to, you know, turn it over to Frank Jeskalki, who is our VP of Intelligence, where he is going to lead a panel discussion with leaders across Medical Alley on what they're doing in this space and how they're engaging with community to build trust to advance health equity. Frank. 
Alexis, thank you so much. And Mojde, thank you so much. Uh, fantastic dialogue and discussion. And for me, it's always a pleasure to uh, participate in a session and hear from 3M. Some of you out there may know that the founder of Medical Alley was a 3Mer back in 1984, a guy named Lee Berlin. And we just celebrated yesterday with one of the companies that came out of some of his work, Kindeva, which was spun out of 3M in the opening of their headquarters. So a, an organization, an institution that continues to invest in this ecosystem and community. Uh, I'm excited to continue the discussion on such an important topic with three wonderful panelists who I'll ask you, uh, panelists, go ahead, throw your cameras on so we can start seeing you. As I'm going through the discussion, as I'm asking them questions, as we're having a dialogue, please do keep throwing questions into the Q&A function. I'll pull those into the conversation. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. And I'm sure there will be more than we can get to, and which will give us a reason to do this once more. So I'm going to start with a couple of quick intros. And what I want each of you to do as you give your intro on, on yourself and your organization, would you also answer the question, what does health equity mean to you and to your organization? And just because of the orders of my screen, uh, Mary, I'm going to start with you. Would you introduce yourself and tell us what does health equity mean to you? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mary Hangen. Uh, my role is Vice President of Patient Outcomes and Experience at Be The Match. Um, and for those of you that don't know who Be The Match is, we manage the most diverse marrow reg registry in the world, and we measure our success by the number of lives we save. So my team um, provides navigation services for patients. We provide um, different support throughout their um, cell therapy journey. And we also do leading um, industry leading research. So we're really tackling um, improving access and outcomes for patients in multiple different ways. So we're located in downtown Minneapolis across from Target Field. Of course, we've been working remote for the last 18 months, um, but Be The Match was recognized by the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal in 2021 as the best place to work. So I feel extremely lucky at this point in my career to have found Be The Match. Um, it's an incredible company and we're doing mission-driven work. Um, as far as what um, health equity means to our company, we wanna make sure that every single patient gets the cell therapy and the, the care that they need. And we know right now that we're not connecting with all patients, especially patients of color. They're not making it through the process. So we want to make sure that we have equal outcomes for all. Everyone gets the, the cell therapy, the, uh, the treatment that is necessary so that they have great outcomes. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I, we'll probably talk more about that because the work that Be The Match does, there are so many unique things that break down by race and gender and other criteria that, that make your work just unique. And then next I'd ask uh, Kathy from Centricare, if you'd introduce yourself and tell us what does health equity mean to you and Centricare? All right, thank you. I'm Kathy Parsons, Vice President of Population Health at Centricare. Centricare is a health system located in central Minnesota. We serve a couple of different small metro areas, as well as um, five or six um, rural areas. And um, we, we have uh, spent a lot of time in health equity and health disparities. And what it really means to us is everything from um, equitable access to care, equitable outcomes to care, so more of that health disparity side. But the stuff in between is what really matters. You're not gonna get health, um, disparities reduced unless you can sort out what are the reasons that health disparities exist, which means you need to back up into the world of social determinants. And I appreciate everything Moshe said, because it really is about um, learning to listen to the communities and really deeply understand. We all got to where we got to and our organizations did because we, we knew answers and we were good at finding them. And this is really a situation where you need to listen. You're not gonna solve health equity or disparities by throwing answers out there. We must listen. And so for us, um, health equity is about hearing and understanding our communities and the reasons that, re that re result in health disparities. And that's where we, that's how we think about it. Very well said. And I hear you on that. Uh, 
It, it can be said a hundred times, should be said a hundred times more. Listening to the communities we want to work with and be of service to is so fundamental. And then last but not least, I'll ask uh, Dr. Michael Helgeson from Apple Tree Dental. I, I'm so glad you're here because dental, I feel, is an area that it's so important, but we don't, I think, talk about it enough in its role in health equity. So if you would. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, for having me. Again, I'm uh, Dr. Michael Helgeson. Uh, my personal background is in geriatric and special needs uh, dentistry, as well as uh, dental public health. And I'm one of the four founders of Apple Tree Dental, which is a, a nonprofit organization that operates eight centers for dental health and then collaborates with about 150 uh, community organizations. Uh, to deliver care. And we call our model of care community collaborative practice. And it really builds on the theme you've heard from everyone. It's overcoming all of the barriers through collaboration. So our 150 community partners range from Head Start centers where disadvantaged uh, children and their families um, are, are getting educational services, K-12, so working in schools. Uh, working with behavioral health, working with group home partners, um, and then at the other end of the age spectrum, working with uh, long-term care, assisted living, and really rethinking uh, care. So it's really about bringing care to people where they are, where they live, where they receive education, or where they receive other health and social services. Most recently, we've been working with hospitals and medical primary care settings, uh, we're in three hospitals and medical primary care settings where we're able to integrate and co-locate uh, oral health services with other health services. So let us a little bit about Apple Tree and our mission. When I think about equity and health equity, I think about the difference between equality and equity. And equity is about tailoring what you do to overcome barriers, whether it's about tailoring to overcome language barriers or uh, dealing with developmental disabilities and adapting. So it's not doing the same thing for everybody. It's tailoring and doing different things to meet all the different varying needs that unique population groups have. So it's about listening, partnering, and tailoring. And I'm just so excited because much of what we've accomplished over 36 years has been through collaborations with partners like 3M, Medtronic, Patterson Dental. Um, the various industry partners that we have have the experts and the expertise to teach us and help us. And I think the example you heard about getting $60 million of greater investment from the state of Minnesota through the work we did with 3M, that was their expertise and their help together with the expertise that we have kind of on the ground that enabled us to communicate better with the legislature, with the governor, both sides of the aisle, and actually accomplish something that we couldn't accomplish over 20 years of trying without the expertise that the members of Medical Alley uh, have, uh, all this value in their employees and in the knowledge and the systems and the problem solving skills that they have. So I'm just really excited to be part of the panel today. I'm, I'm already hearing a, a common message or theme here of the, the listening, the tailoring to the needs of those individuals, that there's an opportunity for all of us to be in service or of service to people in need, just like we would do any customer or client or patient or whatever we end up terming it. Um, Mary, I might start with you, and I want to set up kind of in a way of what are the challenges, and then Dr. Helgeson, I might come back to you on this topic of the collaborations, but Mary, could you talk about, you know, what are some of the largest challenges that you see in the, the communities that Be The Match serves relative to health equity today? I remember to unmute myself. <laughs> All right. So some of the biggest challenges that we have is um, providing cell therapy to people of color. So um, we have a donor registry. And on that donor registry, if you're white Caucasian, um, like I am, I have a 77% chance of finding a donor on that registry. 
But if you're um, African-American Black, it drops down to 29%. So, um, you know, the chances of finding the match that you need to receive life-saving therapy is, is pretty low. And we're trying to change that. We're really tackling this disparity issue in multiple different ways. Um, we are focused on increasing the diversity of our donor registry. So we're really connecting with the different um, communities. Um, again, that's part of building trust. There is distrust obviously in these communities for the healthcare community. And so joining our registry, um, people could be leery about. So we're, we're doing a lot of education. We're connecting with the, the local communities as well and addressing it through education and outreach. Um, we also have a, a couple of strategic initiatives that we're trying to change the paradigm of healthcare disparity. One of which is our program we, we're calling HLA Today. This is where when a patient is diagnosed with a blood disorder or blood cancer, um, they can get the typing needed at that point. So early in the process. And what this helps is it helps patients um, know what their options are because sometimes especially people of color, don't always get the referral. They don't always, don't always know about all the options that are available to them. So that's at the very beginning of the process. And then we're also, we're, we're doing a lot of research. And one of our research studies is called Donor for All. Um, this is a complete game changer. It's basically um, opening up the way that we do matching. Um, it's, it's, um, it's setting different standards and, and we're doing it through a clinical trial program. Um, and, and this will allow more people to have matches on the registry. That number that I talked to you about before, the 29%, if everything goes the way we expect with Donor for All, um, the, the chances of a Black African-American patient having a match goes all the way up to 99%. So a huge, a huge, like I said, game changer for us we're very optimistic and excited about what this could do for, for the patients and our families. Oh, that's amazing. And it, it, it gets to, there's a, a question from the audience that I'll maybe pose in the background, but before we get to it, Kathy, I wanna ask you about the challenges within the communities you serve, but there was an audience question of asking like, is there a minimum benchmark or how do we measure health equity? And I suspect the answer because it always does it depends you know mary what you just laid out right there are some fairly concrete numbers given the kind of work you do um kathy i suspect it would be different for the work you're doing within centric care where some might be quantitative some might be qualitative could you talk a bit about you know what are the challenges that you see within the, the centric care community for health equity and, and how do you think about the audience members question of uh, measuring progress on it. So we often think about and measure, um, we start with, um, for example, cancer mortality rates. We start, let's say we start with that and we back up into, okay, what gives us indications of the cancer mortality rates? What impacts that? Well, screening. And so then you have to look at the um, uh, measurements of screening of people of color, or screening of people who, you know, various, whatever it is that is different. And then you have to back into the why. So this is where we get back to those social determinants of, you know, there is, I'll use colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer has a, a much bigger impact from a mortality perspective on people of color. If you back into, you look at the, the um, rates of colorectal cancer screening, you see that those are significantly lower for people of color. Well, if you're not screening, you're not gonna catch it early enough to cure it. And, and it is a curable thing if you catch it at the right stage. Well, then we have to back into why is that? And, and that always goes down to a few different things um, that sound like a few and it's really quite a few. Um, are we listening? Do we have access to primary care at times when people can get in if they need to get off their job? We, we in healthcare have been very, providers focused. You come in, you sit down in our hours, our time, and you wait. Um, people who, who are, you know, um, working can't always do that anymore. And, and we need to, we need to adjust that. We also have to look at the long history of reasons why people might not trust the healthcare um, industry. We might want to look at um, costs or consider is a, colorect a, is a colonoscopy the only way 
it might be the gold standard, but it's not the only way. How else can we do it? So it's really hearing and understanding what are the barriers to getting screening. And, and equally, you have to think about if I can't put food on the table for my family, I am not worried about whether I can go have a colonoscopy or anything else. We have, it's Maslow's hierarchy. How do we meet those basic needs that other countries have done a far better job of than we have? How do we make sure basic needs are met so people can actually think about um, these other things? So it's access, it's, it's all the things everyone's talking about. Um, and so we, we have to approach it from that perspective. So it's oftentimes someone will say, you have to get your cancer screening up. And we say, yes, and we must figure out how to deal with those things that prevent people from getting screened. When you hit on something there that we've heard in other discussions that's so fundamental, often those of us in healthcare, we're, we're very focused on the area we're in, the thing we know, but healthcare is one part of a person's life. It's not the only thing. Dr. Helgeson, you talked about um, getting Apple Tree Dental into the Head Start programs, into primary care clinics, and as long as I've been around healthcare, right, dental and healthcare have been separate things. It, it sounds like through those collaborations, you're, you're crossing that chasm a bit. Could you talk a bit about that of building those partnerships and breaking down those barriers that, as Kathy talked about, might prevent access? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, when we look at, at access to dental care, uh, when, when people that are on Medicaid, which are low-income populations, when they're surveyed and asked, did you have a healthcare need that you couldn't meet? Doesn't matter if it's Minnesota or you pick any state in the country, dental is always by far and away the number one uh, need that low-income populations have uh, that they couldn't meet. And if you look at, you know, well, why is that? Well, you look at, again, it was mentioned, we tend to have a provider-centric frame. <laughs> you know, we set our hours, we locate ourselves, and we expect people to do all of these behaviors to come to us <laughs> to get the services that we know that they need. And often they don't know that they need, or again, in their priority list in life, it's not on their list. So one of the things that we did is reframe the question is how do we create an oral health care delivery system that targets the population groups, the geographies, the people that we know have the highest rates of dental diseases and often have the least access, the least knowledge about oral health and the things that can prevent oral health and things like that. So uh, over our 36 years, and we started at the old age, end of the age spectrum in geriatrics, I mentioned that was my background. How do we get optimal uh, oral health care to people in long-term care? And the answer was, well, let's work with the nurses. Let's work with the long-term care providers. Let's work with the geriatricians. Let's find out what else is going on in those settings and figure out how can we best integrate uh, oral health prevention, delivery of services, so, and developing mobile systems. So really changing instead of expecting people in long-term care to come to a dental practice, literally create, design, build mobile delivery systems, software systems, new staffing models, um, and actually bring the care into the setting of long-term care where you're working hand in hand with physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses, things like that. Same thing with Head Start. A lot of those families, single moms, uh, very little access to public or private transportation. Again, in their hierarchy of needs, taking their kids for a dental checkup if they don't perceive an issue is not gonna fall high enough. But if we work with the Head Start Center and we can screen every 100% of those child, children there, identify the children that have risk factors, educate every single child, we can get to a point of 100% access, zero disparities, and that's our goal. But we have to do that by rethinking everything we do and delivering it in different ways. And the beauty of Medical Alley and the folks that are on this is that's the kind of creative thinking problem solving that all of these organizations do every day. And often the folks like us that are in the nonprofit sector don't have that level of expertise in how to, how to engineer these solutions. And I think for Apple Tree, to the degree that we've been very successful, it's been through 
collaborations with and technical support from um, all of the other kinds of health and social services and medical you know, providers that are out there. Oh, it's very interesting. Yeah, what I hear you describing in some ways, if I, I put on a business hat, took off my nonprofit hat for a sec, was you know, re-engineering experience and process and then building distribution networks to get to people who need the help and get to that 100% access, 0% disparity. It's a great way of connecting nonprofit and for-profit. And Mary, there's a question from the audience that as a follow-up to a comment you had made that kind of builds on what Dr. Heldison said, which was about outreach and education. The questioner was wondering, you know, what have you found to be most effective or highly effective when you're trying to target the spare populations and engage them, listen to them, and adjust the work that you're doing? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think what's worked best for us is um, to make sure that our employee population looks like the patients we are serving. Um, and so we've had to take a hard look at ourselves over the last few years because we're very Minnesota focused, um, getting the diversity from a patient or from an employee perspective. And we all looked the same, you know, we looked like, like me. Um, so we've done a lot of work there so that we have employees that can connect with the different communities. We've got a ways to go, but we're, we're making some great inroads there. Um, also, we've been putting employees in local markets. So they understand the markets, they're part of those communities. I think it, it lends to a better listening session, um, better understanding of each other and getting kind of to the core issues. Um, but it has to be a long-term game. We can't just jump in and jump out. I mean, we need to stay in these communities and build long-term relationships. Um, and, and that's really what our focus is. Well, I, I might just stay with you for a sec and then yeah. go around the room. I, I have to ask the question of how has the pandemic affected our work? I'll say from Medical Alley Association's mm -hmm. perspective, being able to do conversations like this simple thing is, has been a game changer to bring people in that would have been more difficult to bring in in person, have deeper conversations. But what has that meant for the work you're doing in your health equity work? And Mary, starting with you, how has it changed Be The Match's efforts to engage in the communities? Yeah, well, um, we were very focused again here in Minnesota. We were in the office. We've been working from home for the last 18 months. Um, but I will tell you, we had the best year ever. And again, we, um, we rate ourselves or we measure ourselves by number of lives saved. During the pandemic, um, we had to get cells, so cells, uh, marrow cells, um, to patients around the world or cells from around the world to us. And um, so borders were closed. I mean, we had to work with consulates. Um, it was incredible, the, the dedication of the employees at Be The Match to make the impossible possible. And we did not miss one time when a patient was getting their um, pre-regiment to, to you know, which is um, chemo, et cetera, to prepare for the bone marrow or peripheral cell um, therapy. We did not miss one time giving them the cells that they needed. And that was 10,000 patients. So what we proved was we could work remotely and do a really, really good job and still stay connected and, and meet our patients' needs. Um, I will tell you though, with uh, with all the unrest that came at the same time, um, I think you know that was harder to have conversations when we were all remotely, and there were kind of uh, you know layers of things happening between the pandemic and all the unrest that was locally happening here. So um, as I mentioned before, we really are now focused on. I think the George Floyd is issue really brought forth um, the need to really look at our employee base, look at our practices who we partner with in the community um, and just really be crystal clear on helping to advance our DEI, our strategy. Um, and we're making some inroads there. And Dr. Hedlison, I'll ask you the same thing because I know dental was particularly hard hit during the pandemic, partly the nature of the way the medicine is practiced. Um, how did it impact your work and what have you seen come out of it that maybe has been a positive for your work? 
Sure, uh, that's a great question. And we were particularly impacted given that we work in the airway. <laughs> yeah, we know uh, COVID is transmitted in that way. Uh, it, maybe I'll shout out 3M again, <laughs> their personal protective equipment, <laughs> training and things like that. I, I think, you know, dental practices have had uh, universal precautions for years and years. And, and so I think our preparation for dealing with, uh, you know, the type of thing uh, with the pandemic was, was pretty good. But again, thinking about uh, all of the health and safety issues in our offices and being able to evaluate, you know, the airflow and air exchange and all of these uh, methods of keeping us safe and keeping our patients safe. And again, our partnerships across, you know, industry and with our medical providers were the key to figuring out how to adapt, uh, upgrade, and create work, uh, safe work environments uh, and keep going. Um, the get to yes group, uh, just channeling what you were saying about your group and being able to get together, build trust. The get to yes group brought together the state's critical access dental providers. So the groups like Apple Tree, Hennepin Healthcare, Children's Dental, uh, the, really the backbone of meeting the needs of underserved populations. We met every single week something we had never done. And we did this using these Zoom technologies and we were sharing everything. You know, where are you getting X? You know, uh, how are we getting approval to do uh, teledentistry direct to patients and working with state agencies? So we worked more closely, built more trust, solved more problems and bonded together uh, in a way that we hadn't done before. And then again, with 3M's help and the development of this white paper, we were able to simplify our messages, make them very compelling, convey them to legislators and to the governor and the governor's, uh, you know, the Department of Human Services. We were able to work together and accomplish things that we hadn't been able to do for several decades. So, you know, uh, when you get a big challenge, <laughs> sometimes it, it forces you to really, uh, pull together and do things in new ways. So I think we're coming out of it with a much stronger group, much better organized, and we're gonna be able to team up with more partners going forward and really work to address these underlying disparities. One just final note, you know, we've talked about the need to have our, uh, our staff and our clinicians look like the populations we serve. And, Another project that we've done with 3M is we've launched something called the Career Equity Project. We're real excited about that. Um, the dental profession is the least representative of the health professions. Um, it was stated that if every single dental school uh, position in the United States and Canada were filled with an underrepresented minority, it would take a decade for them to get to their appropriate percentages in the oral health profession. So we have a really systemic issue that the right people are not getting into the oral health profession. So again, with technical help from 3M, we've launched a project where we're linking with local high schools near each of our eight centers. We're working with community colleges and we're trying to create paths where we can provide all the help and support that underrepresented kids from high school all the way through to becoming whatever level in the oral health professions they want. But it's a, it's a career support system where Apple Tree as a nonprofit is acting like the family that others who maybe get those opportunities, we're acting like those family supports for those kids so they can get to wherever they need to get in the oral health profession. So very excited about that. Yeah, and I, I'm now hearing a, a second theme of the need to truly go upstream to address these issues, right? It, it's not just building a new program and putting a metric in place. It's re-architecting our organizations and the way we structure ourselves and our activities to really make that impact. And Kathy, I'd ask the same of you and, you know, centric here being in the middle of the state, you have an urban population, you have rural populations and a very large geographic area that you serve. Uh, how did it affect centric care and what came out of it that you go, ah, we learned something or we did something really positive as a result? In so many ways, um, we, uh, as the pandemic hit, 
um, initially. Um, it's not gone. We're living that right now. But um, as, as it hit, um, we realized that we, we have a fairly large refugee population in the St. Cloud area. Um, and we realized we have a community population wellness team that um, are people in and among that community who help us um, to communicate and, and get word out. We were going, we had people going door to door, but ultimately we started to use different technologies to, to help get education out. Um, we all, there was one night we had 500 people from the Somali community on one call um, where we were answering questions and they were telling us where their challenges were particularly we have meat packing, packing plants in the area. And finally we said, wait a minute, gotta go upstream. And so we actually reached out to the meat packing plants and started to provide both testing and vaccines there. Um, and we started, we're working with, in ways with employers that we never did before to say, you know, here, this can help you and it can help your, your employees and it helps us get word out. Um, we landed on Somali TV several times and, and actually that was shown in Africa. Um, and we actually had a couple calls from there, you know, saying, now what do we do? Because we did a lot of education. Um, we are doing um, many things differently now. And of course, the, the murder of George Floyd, you know, just exemplified all the different things that are wrong and, and how we need to amp up our game um, in many different ways that have already been referred to. But um, we really did start to fundamentally rethink how we reach people and how we listen. Our mission is um, to listen and serve, guide and heal. And we really had to back up to that listen, serve and guide um, and help people understand and take people where they are um, because there are long histories of reasons why there's mistrust or misunderstanding. And so we are, and then we too, why is it we have a pretty good, um, process of, of hiring people of, of diverse backgrounds, but we don't keep them as well as we should. Well, we had to look internally and say, why is that? What is it about our organization that causes people to say, yep, thanks, but I'm moving on. And so we've had to internally look, you can never do this work only externally. You have to, and as everybody said, look internally and say, what do we need to do in our own house before we can pretend to help everyone else? So I think it is all that has been said, um, we are really dedicated to, you know, vaccines. Sometimes we'll go somewhere, we only do eight, but we've listened to them. We've heard their concerns, we've addressed their concerns and we accept where they are. And I think that um, we're doing that more and more with all sorts of different services that really um, will help long-term solve health disparities. This is not a short-term game. And, and we have to be in it for the long haul and it has to be fundamental change to how we think and how we act and how we reach out um, to different communities and how we partner with um, businesses of all sorts to say, what can we do together differently? I mean, I think that's a really good call to arms or call to action for all of us of the looking internally, right? If we're going to say that we're leaders, whether leaders in our organization or in the community, we have to be the ones to say if there's something wrong, it is on us to understand, to listen, and to work on it, not on someone else to fix it. And so, Kathy, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, there was a, a question from the audience wondering, can you shed any light on what you've learned so far relative to uh, the BIPOC staff retention issue and some challenges that CentraCare is working to overcome? Absolutely. So um, one of the things we learned when you are in a small, smaller group, you know, you don't have that, those connections, you know, the, our health system is a large sprawling space and people don't see each other. And if, if you're in an area and you don't have other people who um, have anything um, in common with you related to you know, your, your background, your culture, it's really hard to stay. People don't, you wanna be with people that you feel like you're connected to. So it's about help, it, part of it, not all of it, has been about helping connect people and then helping um, us, all of our staff to be more welcoming. I will say that, um, Stearns County, where we're, our biggest organization is located, there's large families and people have all sorts of connections already. There's a lot of people not looking for new friends. 
And so how do we help people make those connections? How do we become a place that is full of additional and new and different connect connections? So ERGs, the employee resource groups, those have been helpful. But even as we bring people in from the local technical college, you know, they've been in one place, how do we bring them into another and keep them connected to each other, even if they're not physically together? And of course, technology helps us stay together differently now. Um, I say that that works in St. Cloud. Broadband continues to be an issue in rural and we do serve a large rural population and there are significant health disparities in rural populations. So we're also tackling how do we give care differently and how do we um, connect people, you know, that came clear in both education as kids were sent home and then couldn't, either they're rural and they couldn't afford um, to have uh, the, the access, uh, internet access, or they didn't have the money to afford it. So those are, that's still, infrastructure in this country is still a very big issue. Well, and that gets at, there was a question from the audience about the role of telehealth. And I, I've heard from many organizations, both rural and urban, what you just said of, Telehealth can provide a means of access, but it also can create new forms of inequities because high-speed internet is not evenly distributed or equitably distributed. And so all it, it can be part of a solution, it's not the solution. Um, you know, I might now shift to a slightly different topic and kind of I'd call it the, the meat of this discussion which Dr. Helgeson, you've alluded to a few times, uh, the power of partnership, the collaborations. You know, in the nonprofit world, we often say no money, no mission. And right, if you can't pay the bills, if you can't keep the lights on, a lot of the rest of it is challenging. But once you get past that point, there are so many other things that we need to do as organizations. And you've talked a little bit about working with 3M, Medtronic, others, on um, process improvements, things you've done. Could you just maybe go into that a little bit more of some of the work you've done there and how those sorts of collaborations have been helpful? And then Mary Kathy, what I'm gonna ask you about is kind of building on that, what are the things we as a community, as industries could do to better support the community actors that are out there? So Dr. Helgeson, if you would. Sure, I, I would just make a general observation that a lot of the nonprofits that are really sort of the boots on the ground, for lack of a better term, you know, that are really close to the underserved populations and have some of the best connections with them are relatively small organizations. And so they do not have people with expertise in project uh, planning and, you know, implementation and, and marketing and how do you and and uh, advocacy, you know, how do you work together? A lot of times we're small, isolated voices, you know, lots of great ideas, but we don't have the business skills to convert those good ideas into scalable solutions. And all the folks on the medical alley are rich with experts, <laughs> you know, they've got real richness in their employees. And those employees, if, if they are given an opportunity to partner, can be unbelievable catalysts that can help uh, the folks that are on the ground um, really scale up things that work or conversely stop doing stuff that just isn't working <laughs> to be able to analyze you know, what you're doing and to be able to systematically um, improve and scale it up. This is what the larger scale businesses, this is what they're doing. And I think if they can cross, you know, between, you know, sort of the private and the nonprofit sector and help leverage all of that knowledge and expertise, it is much more than the money. Uh, you know, if you, if you give uh, the folks on the ground the tools, they will generate the revenues and so on. So I, for me, I think that's a huge theme. And I, I mentioned the, you know, the Get TS group, which yielded a huge public policy investment that uh, was 20 years you know, in the making. But uh, by having 3M's global expertise, you know, they work on advocacy in countries all over the world. And to have that level of expertise coaching this team of critical access providers, you know, meant all the difference between 
another year of failure, you know, at the legislature and the biggest success we've had, uh, you know, in several decades. And similarly with our career equity project is another example where, you know, we had folks there really helping us study the landscape, you know, what's going on with STEM, you know, programs, what's going on with community colleges. Um, who are the organizations that we can best partner with? What best practices are already out there? And really leapfrog us in an eight week intensive planning process with volunteers from 3M. We created a comprehensive plan that we're carrying out right now. We already are piloting with some students in high schools in just a few short months. So uh, I just, I, I hope everybody that's on this recognizes that it's not your cash you know, which is in short supply, and obviously you can use it in your own organizations, but it's all of that expertise that your employees have, and if you can connect them, it will be meaningful for them, they will enjoy their job in your company better, and they will be making a difference to address some of these systemic problems that we are all, you know, in it to try to solve together. Very well said, and I, I would echo and amplify at the those small organizations that are on the front lines, they've been listening to the communities, they quite often have good ideas on what needs to be done. Scaling those ideas up is a, a different thing. And that's what, for those of you in the audience, many of your businesses are so expert in taking the good idea and scaling its impact. And that's a benefit then to all. Um, Mary, I'll ask you, you know, in the, in the work you're doing, Be The Match is a nonprofit organization. Where are you seeing those collaborations create value in the work that you're doing? Yeah, I, th I think the, the biggest thing is connecting. And so I think Michael talked about that. Um, sometimes we don't know what other groups are doing, but um, we've connected with a lot of other nonprofits, especially in the advocacy space. Um, we passed or were part of passing seven bills last year to help our patients in different ways. Um, sometimes it's access to care. Um, so, but, but it was working with the American Cancer Society, working with the uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, just really trying to understand where we could leverage each other, where we have common interests, and then how can we go to do different things together? So I think that's a really important point. Um, but then connecting, because as I, even as we're talking, I'm thinking, boy, we could leverage each other on so many different things. It's just trying to understand what's out there, what different groups are doing, and then how can we work together to make a big difference, especially in our local communities. Kathy, I'll ask you the same. Centricare, obviously a nonprofit health system and a large organization. Maybe you have a, a different take on it. Well, no, I would, I would agree with all that has been said and, and maybe add, um, we want to avoid silos. There is a lot of work being done by a lot of different folks. And, and to Dr. Helgeson's point, you know, it, it, when you can come together, you can accomplish so much more than individually. And so um, trying to, to really talk to your, you know, talk to the communities you're working with. And yes, the people, the knowledge, um, it's that in-kind stuff. Sometimes it's space. Um, people have no place to do something, what they want to do. So, you know, it's a lot of different things. And occasionally it's cash. But, um, but I think that that's not the single biggest thing. It really is about how do we think differently about what we're trying to accomplish and then prioritize. Because there really are some things that are, sound like a great idea, but what's their ultimate impact? Maybe not as much as we would think. So helping to prioritize what will make the difference and, and avoiding pet projects um, to get to what's the real impactful project. And, and I too hear um, of lots of opportunities, even in, in, as we're talking here, but really work with your local communities, your local um, boots on the ground. And it, when it comes to health equity, your local health system who pre pretty much should have some good sense of what it is that, where are the, the biggest gaps that really need to be filled. And remember that those social social determinants are really so critical um, to, to help solve as a, as a nation, but even just locally and internal communities. I'm now part of a, a mental health steering committee in our community that involves judges and lawyers and the correctional system and mental health providers to say, how do we not 
um, cause more issues where we don't need to? How can we take care of people with mental health issues differently? And that's a place where we see big disparities too. So it's really just reimagining what could be. Oh, well said, and I love that. The, so much of what happens in or to healthcare is either a result of what's happening somewhere else in a person's life or impacts somewhere else in the person's life. But far too often, we've, as you said, we've had silos. And maybe as we're coming into the end here, I might ask that as maybe a final question relative to silos. You know, what sort of work are you doing or are you seeing as beneficial to break up those silos? You know, Kathy, you just talked about the work with the judges and other groups. Dr. Helgeson, you talked about the Get to Yes Coalition. So maybe, Mary, I'll give you the last question and ask, you know, how does Be the Match see the different organizations that are out there, the different groups that you might interact with, and how do you break down those silos for your work? Yeah, well, we are um, starting an, an initiative, both internally and externally, that's going to be focused on reducing healthcare disparities. So we have a uh, we have a large network of transplant centers that work with us, and we want want to really get um, physicians to do a pledge um, that they will focus on this work, and um, we also want local partners as well as national partners. So we really, I mean, Be The Match, our mission is to democratize cell therapy. We know we want to make sure that every patient has um, access and um, the treatment and the right outcomes. And so we, we have to do something bigger. What we've been doing has is is been somewhat small. So we wanna do something bigger, both internally and externally, um, just to start making these connections. Um, and so I love what, um, um, uh, Moja, Moja talked about as well with linking the for-profit and non-profit. I think even this group on this phone or on this webinar could also benefit from this if we start joining arms together to really make a difference locally and then hopefully nationally as well. Very well said. And I might just summarize the themes then that I heard from the group and kind of put for all of us the, the call to action. You know, Health equity includes looking inside ourselves and our organizations, that partnering, especially between nonprofits and for-profit organizations, can bring different expertise to the table and can help to scale up these impactful ideas. And that innovation is not just new technologies, it's also the processes, the systems, the policies, the way we go about our work and that all of these things together are what are going to help us get to a more equitable healthcare system. Um, I wanna say thank you to all three of you for sharing your time, very busy, sharing your expertise, and also participating in this community. We talked a lot about busting silos, and I think that's really the power of this community that we care enough to stand together and say, okay, I've been doing something, but you could do it better or we could do it better together and not be so internally focused. So thank you all. Thank you to our audience for participating today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And as always, thank you for being a part of the Medical Alley community. Have a good one.